Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. Until recently, Ethiopia has been hailed as an African success story. After a decade of strong economic growth, the country has begun to shed its image as a famine-struck wasteland. Africa's second most populous country has also been a strong Western ally in containing the militant group Al-Shabaab in nearby Somalia. But repression by Ethiopia's authoritarian government has sparked protests that have led to the deaths of hundreds of protesters this year. The movement gained worldwide attention at the Rio Olympics when the country's silver medal-winning marathon runner Faisa Lelesa crossed his wrists above his head at the finish line in a symbol of the protest movement. Now, since then, the situation in the country has only grown worse, with more than 2,000 placed under arrest in the past month and the government declaring a state of emergency. Diplomats and journalists have faced travel restrictions outside the capital, Addis Ababa, and the government has periodically cut access to the Internet and even banned the crossed wrist sign given by Faisa Lelesa. Now, later in the show, we'll hear from a panel of experts, including a Bloomberg News correspondent on the ground in Addis Ababa. But first, a quick disclosure for all our listeners. I was previously a foreign correspondent in Ethiopia and have done av advocacy for a Skinder Nega, a jailed journalist there. But with that, we'll go to our first guest, Sadali Lema. She's the editor of Addis Standard, a magazine which has been forced to stop printing in late October due to the state of emergency. Sadali, welcome to Global Journalist. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, if you could tell us what is the genesis of these protests, exactly who is protesting and why? The genesis, um, I, I, the way I saw it, I divided into two. The, the, the first of the several protests that rocked Ethiopia for the last one year broke out in November 12, 2015. We're approaching the first year anniversary to that. It happened in a small town not far from the capital, Addis Ababa. Um, the town is found in Oromia Regional State, which is the largest of the nine regional states according to Ethiopia's federal arrangement. So these protesters, um, pro the protesters are led by the Oromo people, uh, who are the largest ethnic group in Ethiopia, uh, which in itself is home to 80 plus ethnic groups. The why is why I divided into two. The immediate cause of this protest is an, uh, an opposition against what's now popularly known as the Addis Ababa Master Plan, and uh, was developed by the federal government. Protesters were against, against it because this master plan is essentially uh, an elaborated blueprint to expand the capital Addis Ababa into neighboring towns, which belong to the Oromia regional state. So it would have, you know, the, the, the federal government would have done it so without due consultation with the Oromia regional state, which is in charge of the region, and without due compensation to the Oromo farmers who would have been displaced from their land. And, and so there is, there is this ethnic dimension to the conflict, it sounds like you're placing the start of things about a year ago when the government tried to expand the city out into Oromia, displacing ethnic Oromo farmers. Tell us just a little bit about sort of the ethnic divisions in Ethiopia. My understanding is that part of what's driving the discontent is resentment against another ethnic group, the Tigrayan ethnic group that's seen as being dominant in the government. That, that's correct. That would lead me to, 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 the, to the fundamental reason of this protest that was happening um, in the last one year, uh, which is that the Oromo people, uh, being the largest, or overwhelmingly the largest, I would say, uh, majority in the country, uh, they feel, you know, they, they believe, and in many cases it's true, uh, that the fundamental question that has been simmering within them was, uh, the lack of genuine political representation, because as you say, the political space is dominated by the minority um, uh, TPLF, which hails from the north. Uh, the presence of widespread rights abuses within the Oromo nation itself and pervasive economic marginalization and all this. So these are the fundamental um, um, questions that have been simmering within the Oromo and also the other parts of the country's population, like the Amhara now, as we have seen it yeah, lately. Tell so us about the Amhara region, because we've seen that there have been protests by ethnic Oromos against the government. Now, another large group, ethnic Amharas, this past year, we've seen have also been taking to the streets. And there have been a number of people that have been killed and arrested in those regions as well. What are their grievances? 
Uh, their grievances are as well, uh, the genesis to that dates back to 25 years ago today when Ethiopia uh, uh, started to arrange itself in a, in a federal settlement that it follows today. It, it dates back to uh, 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 grievances by the Amhara people against uh, a land um, that they believe was taken from them and was incorporated into the Tigran regional state, which is home to the mighty TPLF. So the Amhara were also The TPLF is sort of the core of the government's ruling party that's made up of ethnic Tigrayans then, is that right? Yes, it is. Uh, it's the core and it's the most dominant as well because uh, these are uh, the people who have fought for, for 17 years during the civil war uh, of the Derg era. So uh, that they believe by default, you know, uh, gives them the right to, to dominate the political space there. So the Amhara uh, people have been protesting about this, this, this arrangement, which took the land, part of a land, and incorporated it into the, the Tigran regional state, which is home to the TPLF uh, uh, within, the, within, the, within the ruling uh, party in Ethiopia. Well, tell us, if you would, about the media inside Ethiopia. What kind of a picture are people inside the country getting from television, from radio? Your magazine was just shut down. Well, right now there is not much coming out, uh, and there has not been much from the traditional media coming out over the last one year as well. I mean, there have been, uh, of course, several attempts by journalists like uh, William there in the panel, uh, but most of the media uh, consumption was coming through the social media, uh, which was uh, um, just controlled by, by the people who are protesting, you know, the people themselves. So, so you couldn't turn on the radio and find out what was happening or watch television inside Ethiopia and find out what was happening there? Not, not much. It's, uh, if you hear about it, it's pretty distorted because the media landscape in Ethiopia, um, I would say more than 90% of the media ownership landscape in Ethiopia is uh, either owned by the government or um, in institutions that are affiliated to the government. So when you hear about, if at all, uh, about the, the, the ongoing protests, you hear them in a way, small people in some areas, some people in some places. So it's pretty, you know, uh, quite the opposite of what was happening on the ground that we've been getting from the, uh, from the state-owned and affiliated media institutions on the ground. And you mentioned the role of social media, even in these fairly remote places of Ethiopia, as being sort of a tool that protesters have used. What, what do we know about that? The government has been shutting off the Internet in parts of the country. Yes, um, the government, um, it's not the first time that the government is uh, shutting down Internet whenever they feel like things are going out of con their control. Uh, the first thing they do is to shut down the Internet. But what is, uh, what is true in Ethiopia is that because even under the, the state ownership of the telecommunication, which is the sole provider of Internet in the country, uh, there have been a fa you know, fairly a large coverage of uh, um, Internet uh, throughout the country, which enabled the young people who have uh, nothing but a smartphone in their hands. Um, so these young people are the ones that are on the social media today. So they, they don't want to wait for a government-controlled media to tell their stories. They are in charge of telling their stories using the social media. So that's been the trend. There were a lot of times when we, you know, uh, were unable to go into protest areas, but just, you know, talk to or see people from the actual places or see their posters to understand what exactly was happening during the protests. Sadali Lemma, thanks so much for joining us on Global Journalist. Thanks for having me. A reminder that you're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. This week we're talking about the state of emergency in Ethiopia, where protests against authoritarian rule have triggered a government crackdown that has killed hundreds of people and heightened ethnic tensions. We're now joined by three other people who have been following the situation. In the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa, is William Davison. He's the Bloomberg News correspondent in Ethiopia, and his writing has appeared in The Guardian and other news outlets. In Ottawa, Ontario, is Felix Horn, a senior researcher on the region for Human Rights Watch. And in San Jose, California, is Berhanu Langiso, an activist and former sociology lecturer at Ethiopia's Ambo University.
Welcome to all of you. William Davison, let me start with you because I understand that you were at one of the scenes or nearby one of the scenes of violence here last month. There was this harvest festival in a town called Bishoftu in the Aromia region where dozens and dozens of people ended up dead. Tell us just a little bit about what happened there. Um, yes, well, thank you for having me on the, on the show, Jason. Um, yes, indeed, I was at the what's known as the Aricha Festival um, at Bishoftu at the um, beginning of October. Um, it's the, the largest celebra celebration for the Oromo people, who, who Tzedali just um, in, informed your, your listeners about. Um, it's a very huge celebration. There's, there's sort of up to um, you know, 100,000 people or a few hundred thousand people who attend the event. The numbers are not known. Um, and um, there was a very fervent protest um, that took place at the festival in front of a stage um, where there was um, some speeches due to be delivered by officials and traditional elders. Um, that protest um, was ongoing when I arrived at the festival at sort of 7.30 a.m. On a, on a Sunday morning and, and continued throughout the morning um, and, and got more intense. Um, I think there was some... Um, there was some discontent about who was um, on stage um, and, and that there was concerns that the event had been manipulated by the government. Um, obviously, the event was policed um, and for most of the morning, the Oromia Regional Police um, tolerated this protest, which is in itself is quite unusual in Ethiopia. Um, but the protest became more and more fervent um, and it resulted in um, people approaching and clambering on the stage. One young man grabbed a microphone and very bravely um, shouted his uh, rejection of, of the government and that was wildly appreciated by the huge crowd. Um, anyway, the crowd uh, clambered onto the stage and at, at that point the regional police responded. Um, then events um, get um, slightly unclear but we know that tear gas was fired by the regional police to disperse the crowd. We heard other gunshots as well. Um, armoured police units were sent out into the crowd, um, which immediately panicked and fled. Um, and then in, in an absolute tragedy, um, what, what looks like tens or, or probably hundreds of people, um, maybe a figure of around 100, 150 fatalities, um, they sort of piled into a ditch and, and many of them were crushed to death. Um, and this led to a, an outpouring of you know, huge amounts of anger across the Oromia region um, including from the in the diaspora online, um, and led to, to, to several days of, of 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 destruction of property and protests across Oromia, which was met um, in turn by the state of emergency by the government um, just a, a week later. Well, let me turn this to Burhanu Lanjiso then, because we heard William talking about some of the ethnic tension <clears throat> that has been triggered in the country here over the past few months here. It seems strange to outsiders that a country would be divided into specific states on regional lines. It would be almost as if in the United States, instead of having Texas or Pennsylvania or Georgia, you'd have a land for African Americans and a land for Hispanics and a state for whites. Why, why is Ethiopia organized in this way? What sort of challenges does that pose? Well, uh, uh, first of all, uh it is very important to make clear that Ethiopia has over 100 million population and uh, close to 100 different ethnic and linguistic group. And uh, the, the, the majority, the two majority ethnic group, the Oromo and the Amara, make about 70 percent, close to 70 percent of the population. And there are many other small uh, ethnic groups, especially in the southern part of the country. So uh, from the history, these ethnic groups have been intermarried, intermingled, and they, they have been uh, cross cut by their religion, uh, even if there is difference, uh, ethnic differences. So the, the, the current government, the, the, the TPLF, basically used the divide and the rule system to keep the two majority groups, the Amara and the Oromo, apart, because the presence of these two groups especially the solidarity between Amara and the Oromo, uh, put their legitimacy or called their legitimacy into question. The Tigrian group or the, 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 the group from where the TPLF, the, the ruling government came, makes only 6% of the population. So this uh, 
dividing the, the two group and pitting them against each other was the major tactic of, of the current government to, to rule over uh, the country or to dominate the country. I want to make one correction on, on <coughs> Will's uh, comment that uh, the attendances of the Irecha ceremony, the Irecha festival, has been in millions, between two to four million over the last 20, 15 years. It is not really enough. Well, either way, it certainly sounds like it was an enormous festival here. And let me turn this to Felix Horn now, uh, because even before these protests, it does seem that the political climate in Ethiopia was not very open. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Felix. In 2015, the government won every single seat in parliament. In 2010, it was something like 99%. So why haven't elections served as sort of a better outlet for popular discontent in Ethiopia? Well, I think that's a very good question. Um, I mean, one of the things that sort of led to the to the outpouring of, of anger and frustration that we saw after Arecha was that there's just very little space to, to, to express dissent, to, to have your, your, your opinions aired and to have the government act on those opinions. I mean, as you said, there's there's very little in the way of of uh, independence in the in parliament where the, the, the ruling party has 100 percent seats, not just in the, in the federal parliament, but also in the regional parliaments. You know, when you combine that with the restrictions on independent media, independent civil society, there's very few ways to, to express these sort of very legitimate grievances, which is what triggered the, you know, the, the protests that we've been seeing for the better part of a year now. And what do we know about the situation for political prisoners inside the country? We talked about, I think there were 2,000 people arrested over the past month. How many people are behind bars now? I mean, there's, there's very little in the way of access for international um, human rights groups, so it's very hard to ascertain the exact numbers. I mean, we believe that tens of thousands were arrested um, up until uh, June of, of this year, which is when we, we produced a, a major report. Uh, a number were released, uh, but there's still a lot in detention. The numbers that have been detained under the state of emergency, it's really not clear. I mean, the only information that's coming out about that is the information that's coming from the government. I mean, I think in the weeks and months that follow, we'll have a better idea of the, the actual scale of detention, but it's very clear that there's, there's mass arrests underway particularly in Aromia and in and Amhara region. And I should say that we did invite representatives of the Ethiopian government, the Ethiopian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to come on this show. Uh, and unfortunately, they did not uh, choose to accept our invitation. But William Davison, tell us just a little bit about what the environment is like for journalists in Ethiopia reporting on this state of emergency. You were at this festival. Is it easy to get access to information about these protests, about acts of violence? Um, I mean, ge generally not. Uh, the actual Eritrea Festival itself was a bit of an exception because the government rather, I thought, complacently and naively facilitated access um, for, the, for the domestic and international media. So we, it was great to be there um, uh, firsthand to witness events. Um, generally, reporting in Ethiopia can be very difficult. Um, and when you get outside of the capital, Addis Ababa, and you're reporting on sensitive issues, uh, whether politically sensitive issues or, or controversial um, economic stories um, which involve um, displacement and large land investments, um, then the way that the uh, system is set up here allows um, officials and members of the security forces to take arbitrary action um, against anybody, but particularly against journalists um, who they suspect of, of, of not being engaged in activity that is in their interests. So it, it, it becomes possible, it's easy to report in the capital. Um, normally, as Tadali said, there's a good internet connection. Now we have no internet, um, you know, largely, so it's difficult to communicate with contact. And, and always, and we expect, although the story is yet to be told, that during the state of emergency, um, the likelihood of arbitrary action, um, which prevents the, the, the work of journalists, or indeed other you know, members of civil society, opposition, politicians is going to be further restricted during this period because, um, you know, obviously the state of emergency acts to empower um, the security forces even further. A reminder that you're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. This week we're talking about the state of emergency in Ethiopia, where the government has imposed a curfew and cut access to social media in an effort to quell popular protests. We're joined by William Davison of Bloomberg News, Felix Horn of Human Rights Watch, and Berhanu Lengiso, an Oromo activist. If you're interested in more Global Journalist content, visit us online at globaljournalist.org.
There you can read our interview with a former Bucknell University economics professor who is trying to raise a rebel army against the Ethiopian government from neighboring Eritrea. We're also on social media. You can subscribe to the video cast of our shows on YouTube, like us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. Berhanu Lanjisu, I wanted to turn things to you now. One of the aspects of these protests has been that the protesters have turned against a number of sort of foreign investments, foreign companies inside Ethiopia. I believe there was a juice factory that was burned, as well as a number of tourist lodges. Why are foreign investors being targeted? Well, that's a very important question. Uh, the, the protesters turned, uh, targeted the foreign investment because the, the economic rise narrative is the single most important narrative for TPLF. The TPLF has used this narrative to make dictatorship acceptable at global level. So the, the economic, the, the, the rising economy narrative is basically uh, uh, a false narrative because it is, it is mainly based on cooked data. I don't know means there is no growth, there is growth in the country. But this growth has been dominated by foreign investment and the government businesses. The government has been using this narrative to, you know, sell itself to the West, to act, you know, as a democratic government that is that is doing well economically in the country, to get its, you know, support from the from the Western governments. The, can, the, 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 the population or the Ethiopian people know this very well. And when they uh, use, when they continue to use little force against them for almost close to one year, they started to target uh, the base of their legitimacy, foreign investment and the government businesses. That also touched the nerve of the, 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 the ruling party. That is basically why they declared the state of emergency. Well, let so me, the, the, I think you raise uh, a good Jason, point here, Berhanu, and let me, Jason, let me turn this back to William, because I think you had something to, put, to add to that. Yes, yes, I did. And, I, I mean, and this is a more of a, a sort of a general, you know, a, a, a how we approach this subject. Personally, I think it's, you know, very important to get away from binary narratives here. Um, there's very little I disagree with in, in, in what Sadali said in her introduction about the you know the the the, um, the lack of democracy in Ethiopia and then the and the ethnic political problems and a lot of what I agree with um, with what Bahanu has said. But the fact of the matter is that Ethiopia um, uh, under the TPLF, which yes is the dominant power within the government, has very deliberately constructed an authoritarian development mod model of the type that we've seen, uh, particularly with China and other East Asian states. Now the reason I make this point is that. Yes, there are some uh, large uh, doubts about the GDP statistics that are pumped out by the government. But along with that, there has also been significant economic growth in Ethiopia. Um, this, of course, doesn't erase or mean that the political problems are insignificant. But when we're trying to understand um, Ethiopia's current predicament, um, it is a country which has been significantly growing. Um, of course, that growth could be spread more equi equitably amongst the population, amongst different ethnicities. But it is a government that has um, made significant achievements um, during its time in power, as well as having done uh, nothing um, to solve Ethiopia's long-standing political problems and arguably exacerbated some of the engines that exist. In well, the let me turn this to Felix Horn then, because it seems that Berhanu and William both agree that Ethiopia has been following sort of the Chinese model of development in that it has focused on economic development, foreign investment, generating manufacturing, jobs, uh, while at the same time not opening its political system. Are we seeing something of the limits of that model here? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a fair assessment. I mean, you know, for years we've interviewed people that, that didn't um, sort of bear the, the fruits of, the, of this economic model. You know, individuals that were displaced from their land or who, who tried to, to, to complain to the government about different aspects of the development and they were targeted as a result. So there's all this, always this sort of simmering tension and, and the idea that just, you know, a single narrative did get out about Ethiopia's economic growth. Um, and, you know, the other thing to point out to me is that Ethiopia is a very young population that is increasingly educated and they're demanding different things to what their, their predecessors did. You know, so we've interviewed several hundred protesters since these protests began and when we talk about sort of how they view this economic boom, 
I mean, they acknowledge that there has been been improvements. They acknowledge, they acknowledge that there is opportunities, but they don't see that they are benefiting from that. Those economic opportunities, those opportunities are are in their view reserved for those that are more closely affiliated with the government. Um, so that 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 yes, clearly has has limits, and I. You know, I think it was very noticeable to us in the early months of the protests that the foreign businesses were not targeted. You know, the protests were predominantly peaceful, but following Arecha, you know, that frustration just 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 boiled over, uh, somewhat predictably, um, resulting in the targeting of businesses. And that's when the government began to to panic and and, and declared the state of emergency, which is only, in our view, is only going to further exacerbate the tensions. And Burhanu Lanjisu, are there any indications that the government is willing to? compromise to give ground and even if the government is prepared to negotiate with the protesters is there any sort of broad-based opposition for them to negotiate with well i think i think the the protesters are are beyond that they have one and only one question now and that is regime change the government is now ready to listen to people they are now ready to accept uh, this major question, what they are coming out with is now, you know, this cosmotic change, like reshuffling the, the, the cabinet at regional and the, and the federal level. And they are not really, they are not really into their sense. They are not listening to the people for the last one, one year. So I think the country is, is basically exploding. The country is in a very serious uh, crisis. If the government is now willing to listen to the people and uh, willing to, you know, arrange transitional uh, processes to return the power or pass the power to the people, the country will be in a very, very serious uh, uh, problem. Well, let me, let me turn this back to you, William Davis, and our time does grow short. We did see that the Ethiopian Prime Minister, Haile Mariam Desalen, reshuffled his cabinet, brought in, I think, 11 new ministers just a couple days ago. What do you see happening over the next couple of years here? How, how will this situation evolve? I'm, I'm afraid um, all I really see is a deteriorating economic situation, uh, a stagnating political situation, an increasing security focus of the government. Um, you know, I think the, the, the point that I raised about the economy is is kind of, uh, significant because this is a government which has more resources than it used to. It's also a government that very much believes in its own model. Um, now, the government has been rocked significantly by these protests, but we know from the quarter of a century that the government has been in power that it has no real interest in political or economic um, pluralism within Ethiopia. Um, it's a party which wants to develop Ethiopia according to its own ideology. And it's not going to be uh, knocked off that course, even by protest this serious. So I think what we're going to see is a, um, a, a further crackdown. And unless there's some significant reorganization and rethinking of the strategy from protesters, then we will just see occasional flare-ups um, and uh, the protests getting cracked. Uh, getting quashed by, by the That's government. That's going to have to do it. I'm sorry, Will, we're out of time. We're okay. going to leave it there for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Missouri School of Journalism and the Reynolds Journalism Institute. Many thanks to Tzadali Lema, William Davison, Burhanu Lanjisu, and Felix Horn for joining us. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.